Welcome everyone. Welcome to the July session of the Integrated Conservation Webinar Series. Today we have a very special guest that we'll introduce a bit later. So then before, before going to our guest for today, let me just give a bit of a housekeeping notices. So first, you know that this webinar series is part of the, is hosted by Integrated Conservation. The relatively new journal uh, by the Stephen Banat of the Global Botanical Garden is a global journal on conservation science. And then you know that uh, you can access it uh, on, the, on the website. We just published the June issue. This is our our seventh issue published so far. So we have already two years of, of publication. Please uh, go there and check. This is a global journal addressing a uh, Global issues, accepting also case studies, including all kind of taxa and all kind of biomes, you know, geographies at any kind of uh, in biological, biological uh, organization. It's an open access journal, free to read, free to publish by now, and double, double blind peer review. And we very much welcome different, different format of papers from opinion pieces to reviews to research and to policy and practice. We have a several calls for ongoing special issues, one on snow leopards, that the deadline will finish in September. We have an online call for papers on environmental education with a focus on China. And we have a special issue on current and emerging conservation issues in Africa. So if you're interested in contributing to these issues, you can go to our website, and check about the, the call for papers. If you are interested in yesterday in a special issue, or you have any suggestion on topics that are worth to put together as a special section, please contact us, we're happy to discuss. You can follow us on X and other social media. And as you know, this we do this webinar series once a month, and we have very distinguished speakers in all our our webinars are recorded. And if, if there's no technical problem and the speaker consents, we upload them into YouTube and Bini Bini so then you can still go back in time and, and go to them later. So then you can uh, scan this QR code and access our, our website and other resources. So without any further delay, I will go to, to present our speaker today. Our speaker is Professor Rodrigo Medellin from Mexico, from the UNAM, the University Universidad Autónoma Nacional de, de México. Eh, Rodrigo is a very distinguished professor. He has a, a long history studying especially mammals in, in, in Mexico and many other countries. So he runs projects, I think, in around 16 countries at the moment. And he has supervised, I think, over 60 PhD theses, about 300. Eh, scientific articles, and his work has been mainly on, on bat conservation, plant, bat plant interactions, but also on large carnivores and, and other, other endangered mammals. And he has played a big role connecting people, so that he has launched the, the, global, the, the global South Bat, and then uh, also the Global South Cats is in the process, I believe, or I don't know if it's already launched. So. Yeah. Uh, Rodrigo has been the former president of the Society for Conservation Biology, and he's the co-chair of the Bad Specialist Group in IUCN, and he has been advising to the Mexican government in from 2000 in, in different issues about the biodiversity. He is one of the most accomplished conservation scientists, and, and we are very lucky to have him today. So and today he's going to talk about how to do conservation science, implement it, and not that trying. So then, Rodrigo, yeah, without any other delay, yes, the yours. Yes, thank you. Oh, and I forgot to mention Rodrigo. You will see him a bit dark because he's right now, he's very kindly has agreed to, to talk to us from a remote cabin in Sierra Madre, uh, Eastern Sierra Madre in, in the field in Mexico. So then he's in a place with very little electricity. So then thank you, Rodrigo, for the, for the efforts. And also, uh, Rodrigo is part of the Genetic Conservation Editorial Board. So then, yeah, thank you very much and, and all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aims. And thanks a lot for the invitation to Integrative Conservation. 
uh, a fascinating, exciting new journal with new visions, with new ideas. Uh, and we really need uh, this kind of uh, innovation in the context of publishing our work. Um, uh, what I thought I was going to do today is to share with you some of the lessons that I have learned over the past <clears throat> 40 years that I've been working on conservation. And that is why I'm going to share my screen, uh, calling it um, now the title of the seminar, the title of my talk is, is there, how to do conservation science implemented and not by trying. And I don't want to be pretentious and I don't want to tell you <clears throat> what to do or how to do whatever you want to do when you're doing conservation. This is just my lessons, the lessons that I have learned over the past 40 years. And I, I'm just gleaning my examples from three specific uh, cases in which I am going to tell you what we did and how did we turn it into public policy and how did we turn it into reality in the field? So this is the uh, this is the three examples. I'm going to talk first about jaguars, the big cat of the Americas, the biggest cat in this continent where I am. Uh, then I'm going to talk about bighorn sheep, that animal that appears on the upper right corner of your screen. And then I'm going to talk about one species of bat, the long-nosed bats that are really interesting. And I hope that you will agree with me that uh, you're going to find uh, surprising facts about this bat and about how we turn it around from the brink of extinction to a recovered species that everybody loves in Mexico. <clears throat> so let's talk about jaguar. I call the jaguar a transcultural representation of power and superiority. When I say transcultural, it, I mean transcultural. I mean that from the early ages of the Mexican culture, pre-Columbian times, before the Europeans came, and today, we still see the jaguar as a representation of power and superiority. Say, for example, that Professor Ahimsa Campos goes by driving in his jaguar car. Just by that fact, you are going to know that there is someone of power and of superiority driving that Jaguar car. Jaguar car, right? Okay. But then the same thing happened in pre-Columbian Mexico when you saw this type of figure lunging towards you with their incredibly uh, powerful and sharp axes. And you knew that your days have come to an end because this is the special forces of the Aztec empire, of the Aztec army. So jaguars have always been representations of power and superiority, but they also represent problems for ranchers and developers, and it's a challenge for conservation. It requires a real long-term commitment in this case. Uh, about 22 years ago, we published this book. Uh, it was the first uh, uh, diagnostic analysis of what was the status of the jaguar in the American continent. As you see there, jaguars go, uh, in 2002, they used to go from northern Mexico all the way up here, all the way down to northern Argentina down here. And most of all, it was just one continuous population all along the continent with lots of voids, lots of empty spaces where we didn't even know if we had jaguars there. So then in 2017, I did it again. And look at the horrible surprise that we found from one or two subpopulations that we had only in 2002. In 2017, we had 34 subpopulations in the, con in the continent. You can see all of the fragmented populations here. And all of them, except for one, all of the, all of the 34, meaning 33 popula subpopulations, are either endangered or critically endangered, according to IUCN. And there is only one population 
the Amazon Basin population that is least concerned. But we cannot operate on these conditions in which only one population is safe because that is that amounts to just having all your eggs in one basket. You cannot have that. We have to counter that and make sure that we can recover those populations that are endangered or critically endangered. So that is when we started working the National Jaguar Project with the Mexican Ministry of the Environment with the objective to ensure the future of viable Jaguar populations in Mexico. And with several lines of action, I am going to talk about some of these lines of action, but not about all of them. So in 2006, something happened in my life that is like a dream come true to any conservation biologist. Somebody opened the door of Mr. Carlos Slim, the richest Mexican in the world, and one of the top 10 richest people in the world. He owns cell phones of about 40% of the, of the world, and he's really, really committed to conservation of, of jaguars. He happens to like jaguars, and somebody introduced him to me. So I told him that, that Mexico could be the first country in the world to have a nationwide estimate of how many jaguars do we have in this country. Uh, to do that, we had to determine a standardized, replicable method that would be applied by all of the Jaguar experts that we have all across the country, from northern Mexico to, so to southern Mexico, and select the initial National Jaguar census sites. This is, of course, a, a combination of collaborations between government, academia, NGOs, and the public in this Jaguar Recovery Subcommittee. The funds come from the government, but also from private funds like Mr. Carlos Slim. So then this is the, the, uh, the protocol that we came up with. This is about uh, 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 81 uh, square kilometers here. We divide them into three by three kilometers, as you can see here three by three kilometers. In each of these three by three kilometer squares, we take three stations in which we are going to deploy camera traps. Half of these camera trap stations are double camera traps, one on each side of the trail so that we get both sides of the Jaguar. And we have the wonderful uh, opportunity that in jaguars and in leopards and in no leopards and in tigers, the blotches and the lines and the spots of the animal are absolutely unique to one individual. So we can actually count the number of jaguars that are in there. In addition, in each of these three by three, we have these little squares that are 600 meters by 100 meters that are only uh, geared towards uh, documenting the relative abundance of the jaguar prey in the area, you know, from, uh, from deer to wild pigs to armadillos to any small animal that is part of the diet of the, of the jaguar. Okay. So what you see here in blue are the first round, the first, the top priority areas in which we did the National Jaguar Census. As you can see between the blue and the green that we did, it, sorry, in the yellow that we did in the following year, we are covering pretty much all of the areas where we have Jaguars today, okay? So then the results of the National Jaguar Census showed that we do have several minimum viable populations from extreme Northern Mexico to extreme Southern Mexico. And we actually found surprisingly large populations in regions that are not your, your typical ecosystem that you would find jaguars in. This is subtropical dry areas and still the jaguars are there in extreme Northern Mexico. But yes, of course, the largest populations of jaguars are in the extreme south of Mexico, the rainforest areas, 
and those populations are connected to our neighboring uh, country of Guatemala and our neighboring country of Belize. So the estimated number of jaguars in Mexico that we got in those years from 2007 to 2011 is 3,800 jaguars, which is a big sigh of relief, right? I mean, we have at least a, a number of jaguars that we can still work with for the conservation of the species. However, and this is without any basis, we don't have any basis to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I estimate, my own estimation is that those 3,800 represent about 20% of the jaguars that were living in Mexico 60 years ago. That means that we cannot lose a single jaguar more. We have to keep them in place. We have to launch a series of strategies to make sure that the jaguars are safe. And of course, we have to identify the main threat and guess what the main threat and you people in Asia and any other person that may be listening to this seminar, you will see that the main threat to the big cats is always hunting. It's always the hunt of the cattle ranchers that uh, want to revenge from the cat taking some cattle or some sheep or some goats and then they go and kill the, the, the jaguar. That is the main threat that we face with jaguar across the continent. So we took an important step, step forward together, hand in hand with the federal government. We put together a protocol of attention to conflicts with wild cats by, jaguar, by, by cattle depredation. And in this case, what is it that we're doing? This program of conflict resolution considers that we have to monitor the population of jaguars and of their prey and work hand in hand with the landowners and tell the landowners, okay, my friend, if you want to join this monitoring of populations of jaguars and the pro program of conflict resolution, you are going to be responsible for stopping all hunts. You're not going to allow any hunt of deer or wild pigs or any other animal that is in the diet of the jaguar, okay? If you do that and you do not kill any jaguars and still the jaguar attack some of your cattle, then the government and the university is going to come and pay you the price, the cost, of, uh, of, the, of the cattle that you lost in that year, et cetera. But you have to be co-responsible with the government, et cetera, so that you do not promote hunting in your land. So if the, land, the, the landowners share the responsibility to keep enough prey for jaguars so that jaguars can have their natural prey. We cannot expect that if the jaguars are seeing that their prey is disappearing, that they're not going to attack my cattle. Of course, they're going to attack the cattle if they don't have their natural prey available. So this has actually worked very well. And uh, we're also working on education on cattle management. And you, some of you may know one of my former students, Dr. Antonio de la Torre, who has been working on educating the, the ranchers on how to manage the cattle so that uh, you know, the, the, the jaguar does not attack as many cattle heads. This is because the jaguar is not big enough. It's not like your tiger. And your tiger is big enough to kill an adult cow. Our jaguar is not a big enough to kill an adult cow. The jaguars are going to only attack cows that are maybe one, two, three, four months old. And that's it. That is it. Once the cattle has reached an age of five or six months, they are beyond the window of opportunity of a jaguar attacking them. But if the cattle ranchers keep their cows pregnant every month of the year and giving birth every month of the year, there's an endless supply of cows, of baby cows, to the, to, to the jaguar. So we concentrate the way that the, that the cows are pregnant into two or three months only. 
So that focuses, concentrates the vulnerability of the cattle to only a few months of the year, and that's it. That is one of the elements on in the education on cattle management that we did and is working well. And we're also working with the, with the Senate, with the Mexican Senate, to devise a law in which any individual who kills the Jaguars will respond to authorities and hopefully set foot in a prison. We need to send a message loud and clear that from now on, we will not tolerate a single Jaguar to be killed. Uh, now, if you go to the, uh, to, to, the, to the literature and you see the publications on large cats, you'll see that the largest number of publications are for lion. And then the next one down is for tiger. And then the next one down is for leopard. And then we know less than half that we know about leopards, about jaguars. There's, there's very, very few publications on jaguars. And that means that we cannot wait until we have learned about the Jaguar and we have brought this column here up to this level. We cannot do that. We have to act now with what we know now. So we need to extract lessons from the other species, from lions, from leopards, from tigers, from snow leopards, etc. We need to glean lessons of conservation from those species and apply them to the to the uh, to the jaguar. So we have an agreement signed with the Kenya Wildlife Service in which we are learning about their efforts to protect jaguars. Uh, sorry, to protect leopards, and we're incorporating their lessons into our jaguar conservation initiatives in Mexico. So this is now a, a reality. It's working really well. Let me take you to the rainforest of southern Mexico. This is extreme southern Mexico. What you see, all of this is green, is tropical rainforest. And I am going to go to this area here, which is the Lacandon rainforest, part of the Mayan rainforest. This is the area where you see in these red lines are the protected areas that are existing right now in that part of the world. It's all tropical rainforest. And there's a lot of tropical rainforest outside the protected area. You can see here the border between Mexico and Guatemala. This is a river. This is a very broad, very wide river, more than one kilometer wide, that divides Mexico from Guatemala, okay? And then the rest of the border is just a line like that, all right? Okay, so it turns out that uh, using uh, radios, and uh, and um, GPS radio callers with uh, obtaining information of where the animals are, then we know where the animals are going to be, and that is going to help us learn what is the next step to develop to develop a new protected area. So here you have only four uh, four individuals: two males in blue, two females in red. And remember that this, oops, this river here is the Mexico-Guatemala border, okay? Right here, this is the Mexico-Guatemala border, this is Mexico, this is Guatemala. Well, I want you to look at this male, this animal here, this is a male that is crossing the river, he's swimming into Guatemala, visiting his Guatemalan girlfriend, and staying two or three weeks with his Guatemalan girlfriend, and then he's going to swim back to come back to his Mexican girlfriend to avoid his Mexican girlfriend to becoming angry with him. Well, this is exactly the kind of genetic connectivity that we need to make certain that it's going to stay there for the future. So using this kind of data, we came to the government with a proposal of a new protected area that you can see there in red. It is still being considered for uh, definition of a, of a new protected area, but uh, at least we are seeing that there is movement between the two countries of Jaguars going back and forth. And that is what we need to preserve. Okay, so the next 50 years are going to be absolutely crucial for the fate of the Jaguars. The law must be applied to the fullest extent. We need to raise political will and commitment 
We need lots of public education. We need to strengthen the cattle insurance program. We need to incorporate lessons from other carnivores and a lot more research management and conservation of critically endangered populations need to take place. But we are along the right track and we have been able to influence policy and to make changes on the ground, okay? So let's go to the next, uh, next example. And this is going to be a dramatically different animal and a dramatically different ecosystem. This is the bighorn sheep, one of the biggest wild sheep in the world. And what you see here is the other extreme of Mexico uh, with a jaguar. We were working in this area down here with a bighorn sheep. We're working in the extreme north, which is very, very dry. In red, you see here the original historic distribution of this bighorn sheep. And in yellow, you see the range of the species in Mexico in 2000, in the year 2000. What you see here is Tiburon Island, which is the biggest island of Mexico. This is about 125,000 hectares. So it's really, really big area in the Gulf of California, right here, what you see here. Uh, so it is part of Mexico. It's the largest island in Mexico, okay? So it turns out that this is the island. You can see it from space. It is 50 kilometers long. It is very, very close to the continent. It's only less than 500 meters from here to here. So really, it's a very, very short distance there. This is Pico Johnson, which is an area where uh, the government in 1975 captured about 20 bighorn sheep and put them in the island because in those years there were no bighorn sheep in this island. So they took 25, 20 animals from here and put them into the island there. Uh, then that allowed us to model the population growth because I have been doing uh, helicopter censuses, helicopter surveys in the island to estimate how many bighorn sheep are in that island. So we know for a fact that there was 20 animals in that first arrow in 1975. There was a, an attempted uh, census on foot in 1987, 88, but that was not very important or very useful at all. And then from this moment on, 1996 on, we started doing uh helicopter surveys year after year after year that helped us to calculate the carrying capacity of the island at about 650 bighorn in the island with what is the largest value of intrinsic rate of natural increase of any bighorn sheep population using the logistic equation up here so this 0.3 is the, la the high, highest value of any bighorn sheep population anywhere in the world, all right? So that population is really in very good shape. It so happens that the island is owned by a group of indigenous people called the Seri or Konkak. This is an indigenous group that is in terrible shape. There is only 800 Konkak left. From those 800, 40% are diabetic. They have a life expectancy of uh, 50 or 55. They, they have extreme poverty, a lot of drugs among the children, et cetera. But it turns out that uh, we started this program for management and conservation of bighorn sheep in the island, in that island. We opened the SETI Trust Fund so that any money leaving the trust fund would have to be a check that is signed by 11 elderly SETI people, okay? It is an international, inter interinstitutional, intersectoral collaboration. And then I started getting in touch with this organization called FNOS, in which it's called the Foundation of the North American Wild Sheep. This is a group of very wealthy people, mostly from the United States, who are interested in hunting bighorn sheep. 
and they want to make sure that there is enough bighorn in the mountains of all of the western of the United States and the northwest of Mexico, there's enough bighorn sheep for them to go and hunt them. So they invest very heavily on their conservation. And the funds generated from there go directly to the SETI Trust Fund. So then I take the SETI chief and his assistant to the first auction. This is in 1995. And I don't know if there is any hunters in the audience. I am not a hunter myself. But when I was there, I was so surprised by how much this, the first permit was auctioned in the auction that the Foundation for the North American Wild Sheep does every year. Look at this figure. The first bighorn was sold by $200,000. Then the second one was sold at $195,000. Of course, the city people have never seen this, uh, this kind of money, and it's only 800 people. So it's really having a very significant impact. From that moment on, the cost, the price of the of the of the auction, and it's always only two bighorn sheep per year. That's it. Only two animals are going to die from those 650 that we have in the island. It's only going to be two that are going to die, two very old male like me that are dying every year. Okay, so from then on, the price of the permits have been about a hundred thousand dollars, which is a lot of money for one animal. So this uh, closes the circle of conservation. Conservation is paying for itself. The city or CONCAC people are obtaining resources for the community development program. The economic diversification of the city is promoted. It's the first time in the last 400 years that the species range is expanding because we are using bighorn from the island to reintroduce them in other areas that you'll see in a minute. And there's a lot of research going on and biodiversity conservation in the island. Good hunts and conservation success are promoting the project. This is the largest bighorn sheep ever hunted with bow and arrow. And that man there paid $200,000 to go and hunt that animal, one very old male. The, I've been training the SETI people, a group of young SETIs, that I started working with in the 90s, in 95, 96, 97, 98, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is the technical group that are trained to do all of the surveys, to go on the helicopter, to do vegetation surveys, et cetera. And then we, we, we train them to follow the movements of the bighorn sheep, to do the, the vegetation transects in the island with my students and so on. So last year in May, I went to visit the SETI people, my friends that I trained. Remember that I trained them when they were maybe in their 20s. They are now in their 50s or 60s. And it turns out that each and every one of them has a story of success because their children were able to go to university. There is now in the community doctors and engineers and architects and even biologists who have become biologists because they saw their dad going with me into the helicopter and, and uh, flying all over the island counting sheep. They love to do that. And they said, oh, uh, I want to do that, dad. Can I go to university? And because of the money of the bighorn sheep, they were able to go um, to go to university. So this is an, a, a full success now. And on top of that, we are expanding the range of the bighorn to historical areas. In 2005, we put a new population there. And in 2006, we put another population there, which means that now the bighorn is retaking its original range because of this whole process. So it's a well-rounded example of, of success in conservation. And the cities are in charge of their future. They are in charge of their destiny. They decide what they're going to do with their lives. It's the first time in the, in the history of the cities that that is actually happening. Uh, let's go to the last, uh, last example, the lesser long-nosed bat. And you'll see these bats are nectar-feeding bats. They're visiting an agave flower. And that bat 
thought that I was the flower and look at the, the bat trying to hang from my hat. Okay, so this is the star of the show. These bats were endangered or threatened in 1988, in 1993 in Mexico and in the United States. It's a migratory pollinator and we started the recovery actions in 1994 with a lot of research, environmental education and conservation actions. Everything I have done in conservation all my life ha happens in this three-pronged strategy in which we have conservation actions, research, and environmental education working together and feeding back into each other so that we learn about each of the, of the three fields and educate our actions in each of the three fields. This has been very successful in my life. And we continue to do that with this and many other mammals. Um, what we do here, and let's go to the field again. This is an infrared camera with, uh, with two infrared lights right there. That is going to allow us to see this incredible view. This is from the inside of the cave. I call this picture the arrival. And I want you to please take a look at the bellies of these females. These are all female bats. Only the female bats are, are migrating and they are all pregnant. Look at the very heavy bellies of all of the females in the frame because they're all carrying a baby inside of them. Uh, this squeezes 20 years of work into one single um, uh, slide in which you can see the different arrows, depending on the color and the size of the arrows, is the size of the population. The size of the population in that particular roost from thousands to tens of thousands to this one with hundreds of thousands of bats. And it, you see here that the estimates are very stable from year to year to year to year to year, except in this one, for example, that sometimes it throws 80,000, sometimes it, it throws 30,000, but it's still a big colony. That is the cave from the outside. This is, look at this ecosystem. This is the, the driest desert in North America, the Sonoran Desert in extreme northern Mexico. And what you see here is what the infrared cameras are seeing. Look at that. That is the female bats coming out of the cave they start at 8 p.m. I need to go inside the cave to assess how many babies, what is the reproductive success in that particular uh, year. But I cannot go inside the cave when the females are there during the day because I would create a major disruption and the females would drop the baby. So I have to wait until the last female comes out at around 11 p.m. or midnight and then once I'm out, once all of the females are out there, I walk very, very, very carefully inside the cave. And this is what I see. A carpet of babies. The roof of the cave is covered with babies. This is a one day old, two day old baby. So now I want you to think that you are one of those females that left your baby in kindergarten, in your daycare, etc., and you went to work. And then you come back from, from work and you go to pick up your child and you find this mess. You find this chaos. How are you going to find your baby in that mass of babies? So for that, I have this other video. I want you to focus on this particular baby here. When the video starts, the babies are going to be just nonchalantly looking at each other, stretching their wings to one end, stretching their wings to the other side. And then two seconds after the video starts, this baby goes absolutely crazy. And you still cannot see the female that is going to be coming from here. And this female is his mother. But the female is coming and smelling this baby, smelling this baby, smelling this baby, smelling this baby, and then going to her baby. The baby is absolutely certain that his mother is back, but the mother is not absolutely certain. 
So we are now in the process of trying to understand what the hell is going on. How do they recognize each other because of this, uh, because of this absolute mess? So here you go. It starts now. The babies are there, stretching their wing. Oh, my mom is back. My mom is finally back. Mom, I'm, I'm over here. I'm over here. And then the mother is going and smelling every baby. And then she's not really certain that that is her baby. But then she goes down. And I don't know if she licks the baby or what. But she makes sure that that is indeed her baby. And she lets the baby connect to the nipple. And then the mother lives with her single baby. All of the other babies are there waiting for the mother. But in the process, this baby has found a mother and the mother leaves with the baby like right there, okay? So this is work in progress. This uh, footage has never seen the light anywhere. So what we're seeing here is, is uh, research that we need to do to understand what the hell are the babies seeing in that female that they know that that is their mother and how is the mother connecting to the baby? All of this is work in progress. When you have a population of 200,000, 300,000 females of nectar feeding bats, you should have a, a landscape that is absolutely different from this. But this is how the, uh, the vegetation looks outside the cave. There's really nothing for the bats to eat here. These bats in that season, in this season that we are in right now, in, Ju in July, they are eating the, the nectar and the pollen of the flowers of the columnar cacti that you see one here, one here, one here, and one over here. And that's all. When you have a, a, co a colony of hundreds of thousands of, of female bats, nectar feeding bats, this is what it should look like with all of these columnar cacti providing a lot of food for those females. But instead, this is what it looks like. So our next question was, where the hell are they feeding? This is extreme northern Mexico. This is all happening in this circle right here. And when we expand this, enlarge it, then you see the biosphere reserve of El Pinacate. This is a protected area. This is a volcano, a very old volcano that ended its eruptions about 9,000 years ago. The cave is in the extreme south of the volcanic field. But when you look for the largest columnar cactus fields, they are here and here. And look at the distances that the bats have to fly from the cave to the nearest uh, uh, columnar cactus concentration is 40 kilometers for an animal that is this big, for an animal that weighs 25 to 27 grams only. And to this one is 50 kilometers over there. So are there really bats are going to be able to fly 40 and 50 kilometers to go and feed and then come back and feed their babies in the cave? Well, we're using, again, technology, VHF telemetry radio, a GPS unit, an ultrasonic microphone and recorder. And then we put that on board the bat. With that technology, we have been able to show this. Look at that. Each line is one day the movements of one bat. Each color is one individual bat. Uh, so this is different, different days of several individual bats. This is the, hang on, this is the, the um, uh, volcanic shield. The cave is down here. Uh, remember that the, that the columnar cactus fields are over here and over here. And yes, there's others over here and over here. This yellow line here is the Mexico-US border. So, of course, our bats are flying over the Mexico-U.S. border, feeding in the United States, and coming back to the cave. Tell that to Mr. Donald Trump and his wall. Of course, the bats are going and visiting the U.S. and eating in the U.S. and coming back. Of course, they're going to do that. So, look at this, the, the length of this, this uh, movement. It's really, really, really far. So all information is pointing at the recovery of the species. Mexico contains 80% of the species range. 
18 years of, go, uh, of work show stability or growth, and we have new colonies documented already. There's legal and real protection of the roosts. Education has taken root, and now these bats are protected. Everybody loves these bats uh, in Mexico for the following reason. So in October 23rd in 2013, we announced to the world that this species has recovered from, uh, from the risk of extinction that it was facing. And all of the media in Mexico and in the, in the world took those good news in conservation. Okay, but now the, the listing has occurred. We owe it to the donors, we owe it to the species, and we owe it to ourselves because we've been working on this species for two decades. And now we finally can say, yay, it has recovered because of our effort. Okay, now let's shift gears and tell you why these bats are so incredibly important for Mexico and the world. And I hope you will agree with me. This plant is called the agave. And agaves are an incredibly useful plant for Mexico and the world. You have it in China growing in many places. You use it mostly for the fiber in the, in the leaves of the, of the agave. What agaves do is they grow and they accumulate sugar year after year after year after year. And then they invest every last gram of those sugars into one single sexual reproductive event. That means that all of the sugars that they have accumulated over many years that are down here, they're investing in this massive sexual reproduction event. And after they grow this, they're gonna have sex once and then they die. Imagine that life. Imagine living for six, 10, 20, 30 years, depending on the species of agave, and having sex once and then dying. It's an incredible life, really. So if we narrow down this association between bats and agaves, this is what you see. The bats are looking for food and the agaves are looking for sex. And that is really not a bad, uh, bad combination as far as I'm concerned. All right, so why is all of this important, my friends? Why is all of this so important? Guess why? Tequila, tequila comes from, an, from agaves. And if there's no bats, there's not going to be any tequila. I hope that you will agree with me that there's a massive, massive importance of these bats because on their survival is the availability of tequila. Uh, look at these statistics of 2022. Over 2.5 billion tons of agave heads were harvested. Uh, from that, 650 million liters of tequila were produced. The economy of more than 100,000 Mexican families is connected to tequila production. Tequila sales represented about $4 billion for that year alone. 60% were exports, but the actual global tequila market is more like $10 billion. So this is really important for Mexican economy and for the world to have its tequila, right? Okay, so then... Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, the problem here is that for more than 100 years, the tequila producers have not allowed a single agave to flower because they have learned that if they harvest the agave before they flower, they maximize the amount of sugar and therefore they maximize the amount of alcohol. So they have not allowed a single agave to, to flower. And the result is that they're using only the baby agaves that grow under the parent plant, which are cloned, which are exact genetic copies of the parent plant to replant their fields. And what that does is that every generation that they do that, they're losing genetic diversity. For more than 100 years, they have done that. Now we know that more than 270 million plants of agave are clones of only five individuals. Five individuals in 270 million plants. So genetic diversity is absolutely zero. And that is the perfect conditions to create a horrible storm 
that is affecting the, the tequila industry now. We started working then with the tequila producers and the mezcal producer is the wild relative of tequila. And uh, we convinced them to allow 5% of the agaves to flower and that will feed 100 bats in each hectare of agaves. And you harvest the remaining 95% of the agaves and then you make, you're making your own tequila and mezcal and the tequila and mezcal that comes from those fields is going to be labeled bat friendly by the University of Mexico with this sticker that you see down here that, <coughs> that goes on the, on the bottle and that tells the consumer, this is a bat friendly tequila. So think about that next time you buy a bottle of tequila. Uh, in 2016, we launched 300,000 bottles of bat friendly tequila. You can see the brand there we have no stake we don't get any money from them it's only their commitment their determination to do things right for agaves and for bats so what you're seeing here have not happened in over 150 years this is mr salvador rosales owner of one of those brands he had never seen an agave flowering and, and he's one of the first who start, who joined the Bat Friendly program. And of course, after you see those flowers growing, then along comes the people who harvest the remaining 95%. And that 5% that you see here, we, we set up mist nets there to make sure whether the bats are actually visiting those flowers or not. And guess what? Of course the bats are visiting the flower. Of course the bats are visiting the flowers. Of course the bats are visiting the flowers. They are visiting the flower. They have not forgotten their food source. And that is the round circle in which we're recovering genetic diversity for this incredible plant. This is a love story that National Geographic gave us the cover a few years ago telling the story between the love story between bats and agaves. And we are the big, big winners of that because of tequila, and because of mezcal. So to wrap it up, I want to tell you the recipe to do science and apply it to conservation. The recipe that I have learned over the past 40 years of doing conservation work. The first lesson that I learned is that we need to get out of our comfort zone. All of us conservation professionals are very comfortable working in our, in our labs, in our classrooms, in our study site, and that's it. And we never set foot outside of that. We never talk to the landowners. We never talk to the neighboring landowners. We never talk to the decision makers. We never talk to the lawmakers, to the government, to authorities. We never talk to anybody. All we do is to do our work and that's it. Well, it's time for us to really get out of our comfort zone and start learning from other sectors of the world. When you do that, when you get out of your comfort zone, pretty soon in two months or in three months, you are going to see that you're comfortable now in that supposedly uncomfortable area, you have become comfortable. And that is your signal to get out of, your, of that comfort zone again and make your comfort zone continue to grow and grow and grow and grow. And that is actually how your universe is going to continue expanding. So that is the first lesson that I learned. The second lesson that I learned is that we have to come down from the ivory tower. Okay, I think Rodrigo is frozen. Let's wait to see if he can reconnect.
Okay, so we apologize for the technical problem. I think uh, Rodrigo uh, is coming back. I'm Welcome back. Welcome back, Rodrigo. Oof. Very good, very good. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> There's a little bit of a storm out there. Hmm. Uh, okay, so what do we do? Yes, you can. You can just continue on that because you were at the at the very exciting moment on on yeah. the recipe. So then, if we can exactly. continue, exactly. Okay, so I go back. So the next one is again. I don't know where was I cut off, but com coming down from the ivory tower in terms of uh, of uh, you know us being doctors and professors and PhDs and so on, and we think we're a different kind of human beings. We're not a different kind of human being, my friends. We are another human being, and that's all we are. So please. Okay, I'm afraid that we might be having more technical problems. Oh no, what's happening? Can you see me? We can hear you now, you can see you now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then let's, let's cross fingers and, and continue. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed it up and uh, this is actually the next to last slide. So come down from the Ivory Tower, I already said that. Work the relationship gradually with all of the sectors around you, all of the sectors in your country, all of the sectors that have anything to do with your uh, subject of conservation. And work with all of those other sectors to define the conservation and science agenda. Don't do it by yourself. You cannot come with your own conservation agenda and impose it on a community or on the government or whatever. You have to jointly define what the conservation and science agenda is going to be, or they're not going to feel that they own the conservation agenda. And this is absolutely crucial for your success. <clears throat> Always carry the research, keep in contact with the other sectors. Even here, when I am in the mountains of Eastern Mexico, I am sending them messages on WhatsApp, on email. I'm sending them beautiful pictures of the things that I am seeing, congratulating them for the most amazing work that they've done protecting this incredible forest where I am and so on. Keep contact with them. They, you know, you, you have to think that all of these authorities are only listening from us when we have a complaint or we need a piece of paper. Well, make it nicer for them. Show them the animals and the plants that they are committed to protecting. Send them pictures of whatever thing that you love and that you saw a beautiful flower, a beautiful bird, whatever. Send it to them. It's very, very important to keep in contact and keep good, good relations with them. And please note that publishing a paper, even if it is in the integrative conservation, is not the end of the work. To paraphrase Sir Winston Churchill, publishing a paper is not the end. Publishing a paper is not even the beginning of the end. Publishing a paper is the end of the beginning. Once you have published the paper, it's your responsibility to go back to those communities, to go back to those decision makers, to go back to those authorities and digest and simplify the lessons that you learned in your in your paper in so that they can adopt it they can absorb all of these messages and use them in your day every in their everyday life and in their conservation programs in their management program it's very important to not say okay i published my paper here's my paper goodbye no that is not the way that things work you need to sit down with decision makers and with other stakeholders and discuss your findings. Otherwise, your paper is only going to be read by 20 or 30 people and then nothing is going to happen with your research. Please think about this thing. Finally, if you're not part of the solution, you are part of the problem, my friends. Going out and doing research is not the solution. You have to have that research relevant for policy. You have to make it into conservation decision-making with the landowners, with the authorities, etc. And of course, you cannot ever give up. 
Yes, yes, yes. Many of my students and friends have said, well, you told me that I should go and, and look for the local people and look for the authorities. And I knock on their doors and they slam the doors on my face. So I'm not going to go back. Well, you've given up already. And the only loser is you and the biodiversity that you are trying to protect. Keep knocking on those doors. Try different ways of knocking on the doors, being gentle, being kind, being understanding, being nice, expanding your comfort zone and coming down from the ivory tower is absolutely all important for the benefit of the biodiversity that we all love and defend. So if you want to learn more about bats, follow me on Instagram with Batman Medellin right there. And everything I have told you today is really the result of the, an incredible group of students that I have. They are the ones who do the everyday work everywhere I am in the world. These people are the ones who are doing amazing, amazing work. And I thank them all for this. And I thank you all for your attention. And now I'm ready to answer some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. It has been really, really inspiring. I am very pleased uh, with the, the final, I mean, the, the whole the whole business has been really interesting with the three examples of success, very different different topics. And I really, I am very happy that you ended up with this, this message about how it is doing conservation science, especially because our Chinese audience, uh, they live in a in a high pressure environment to publish papers. And there's something that I noticed since I moved to China is that the conservation area, but at, at least in academia, is very narrow. You have to publish papers, publish papers. And since that getting out of there is almost wasting time, you know, engaging with other stakeholders, doing communications, doing many other things, is often seen as time you are not working on your papers. And I think it's important to tell to, to to young scholars and to, to early career researchers that, you know, if you want, you have to define what you want to achieve as, as a professional and as, you know, on your life. But but if you care about conservation, publishing papers, I like the quote a lot, is just the end of the beginning. So I think that was a very, yeah. very important message to, to, to send to our audience. So what we will yeah. do now is we'll have a, a Q&A. We have around 30 minutes of time for questions. So I will do some questions first to Professor Medellin, and then the audience can type their questions both on a, on Zoom and on CoShare. Rodrigo, just to let you know, on CoShare, we had something around 1,500 people following last time uh, oh, I wow. heard. So then there's a decent, decent crowd following there. And, you know, for, for my perspective, I had many questions. Uh, I like a lot the three systems. And I want to start with a question about the the bighorn sheep, which I didn't know much about this this story. And I found very 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 effective that method of promoting sustainable hunting with the benefits going to the community and evolving the community on the both the the monitoring to produce the data to decide the quotas and to to get the benefits and to and to feel that they are benefiting from conservation that is really important right so i was wondering why the small quota why to only hunt two males per year is that to create kind of a scarcity so then people pay more for two or is a matter of of some some demographic parameters that's a very interesting question and a great question ahimsa thank you for that uh, let me tell you that, you know, I ran this project from 1995 to 2004, and then I left, and I left the SETI team in charge. Every year since then, they come to me with the same question. And they say, why not more? Why can't we kill more? I mean, we have 650 animals. We can for sure take two, three, four, five, seven, ten, easily. And I go, and this is what you're forgetting, Ahimsa, the law of offer and demand. I okay. keep telling them, okay, guys, if you want to increase the quota to four, you are going to work twice as much for the same amount of money. Because if you have four, the price is going to come down accordingly. So in the end, you are going to be working two times more for the same amount of money. It doesn't really make much sense. 
to work more for the same amount of money because the price is going to come down. What we have done, and we are considering this at this be in, in the island uh, in next month, is maybe because th there's been a lot of complaints about uh, from Mexican hunters that they want to go to that to that incredible island, but they don't have the money to pay two hundred thousand. Hmm. So we may be able to add one more hunt only for Mexican citizens. And they're going to be able to pay 20,000, 30,000, 50,000, which is a lot of money for one animal too. Mm -hmm. But that is hopefully going to uh, win over the support of the Mexican hunters. So that's basically the reason. Yeah, yeah. So Pixel is the, the Ferrari of the big horn ship. So then people have to <laughs> have to wait and it's, it's extremely, extremely scarce. And, and yeah, that, that that's that's a very, very smart approach. Uh, and looking at the, the Jaguar project, so then I, I think it was it's very good to see that Mexico well, first congratulations for the support from Carlos Slim. I think that that is a is a great great yeah. achievement in itself. And then uh, so then now you have very good knowledge of the population size and you know the, the occupancy and the, the distribution. So I was wondering what do you think happened from the early 2000s to the mid 2010s? Do you think there was a real reduction of, of the of the range and fragmentation of the populations or is just that the better data show a, a bit a more accurate picture of what was happening uh, we are pretty confident that we have good data both from 2002 to 2017 coming from all over the world and it's a variance because you have uruguayan uh, sorry paraguayan uh, uh, researchers and brazilian researchers all over that's a massive massive country and Colombian and Peruvian and Ecuadorian and so on. Um, we, we are confident that those are real data. The problem is that in those 20 years, the expansion of the agro uh, agricultural and cattle ranching frontier went crazy, crazy mm -hmm. all over. It's the expansion of the, uh, of the uh, well, it's called the... Um, uh, it's a it's a it's it's a new model of well new model of uh, of development in the world that has pushed the limits on all of our topics and all of our ecosystems and that is what promoted for example imagine when uh, uh, the previous go uh, president of um, of Brazil was really destroying Brazil. That's exactly what happened in all of the countries, including Mexico. Mexico has lost massive amounts of forests and of course of jaguars in those 20 years. So basically it's 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 the the result of the um the way that the world is developing at this point in time. You're yeah, going back to the roots of politics and um and yeah, alignments with with values for conservation and 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 the the trade off with with development. Yeah. So then I was thinking you were saying that uh, there is much less knowledge about jaguars than there is for leopards or for tigers and for lions. And I was thinking how <clears throat> if we had also snow leopards in that graph, probably snow leopards will be the less studied species also because they probably they they live in places with less less people but you know that the very good work the is multiple. happening with snow Le yeah so then they there's a huge amount of of uh, work that has happened in the last 10 15 years i think is we are crossing a, a tipping point in which i think we are accumulating knowledge that allows to do much better monitoring to do much better decision making in terms of management and allows to think of of a better, more hope in order to do to do kind of a science based conservation of this kind of species. And I I would very much like to encourage you discussing with people here in in, in China in Central Asia, to to exchange experiences to learn from each other, and also again I just came from Sri Lanka which has a. A, a very rich population of of uh, leopards, you know, island wild and uh, this leopard. So I think it's so important to transfer, you know, the the knowledge on what is working, what is what kind of models work. Because 
much of this work is not technically very difficult. It's logistically difficult, it's expensive, it requires a lot of engagement with stakeholders and, and learning what has worked and what hasn't worked and thinking about what is needed locally. You know, it is, it's a very, very important uh, step and I think it will be really good to have exchange between you and, and people in this part of the world. Well, this is exactly the vision and the philosophy of the Global South Cats Network. We cannot be reinventing the wheel by ourselves. We have to learn from each other. We have to join forces. Many of you in China and in other Asian countries have faced the same problems than we did, and you have come up with another solution. This is exactly what we have not been able to do all along, all along, ever since we started working on conservation. And there, no offense, I hope you take no offense at him on this, but it has been mostly people from the US or from Europe coming to our countries and telling us how to do things without the possibility of us in the global South, Africa, Asia, Latin America, learning from each other, connecting to each other, bringing each other together and learning together. So the Global South Cats is exactly that. We are having our first uh, meeting of the very, very tiny steering committee in, uh, in the Pantanal in Brazil in October. And we're gonna have people from Asia, you're gonna have people from Africa coming to see jaguars and discussing jaguars, lions, leopards, snow leopards, and uh, uh, tigers. So little by little, this, uh, this philosophy of really connecting and empowering people from all over the global south is going to win over all of our work. That's the best way for me to, to that I can see to learn from each other and to be successful in the conservation of these endangered animals. Yes, it's very exciting to hear about the, the global global South cuts. I, I totally agree with what we are saying about about the importance of the South to South uh, communication and uh, you know having having capacity insight and it has to be has to be local capacity the one that will make the the difference. So then I'm not going to take more of your time. I'm going to pass to the to the floor for questions. So then again, audience, if you want to formulate any question, just type it in the in the chat box either on Zoom or co share. And then I will read them for, for Rodrigo. When you make a question, if possible, please just tell your name, the, who you are and your institution. So then we, we have an idea of, of where you come from. So we have one anonymous uh, question that says, all world, all world bad pollinators and new world bad pollinators all have long tongues. Is there a convergence relationship between them? There is a convergent relationship, but they are extremely different, separated evolutionarily. They split out <clears throat> maybe 30 million years ago. Our nectar feeding bats are about this size. Your nectar feeding bats in Asia are about this size, four or five times bigger. There is some, some smaller ones as well, but you probably know very well I mean, and, and, and uh, you know, this is something that I do in my conservation biology courses. I talk about durian. I mean, Thailand alone gets $270 million every year of durian industry. And every durian is a result of a nectar feeding bat in those areas in Asia, in Southeast Asia, that are visiting the flowers. So you have your own examples of this incredible success. So what I think we need to do is bring all of these examples of nectar feeding bats benefiting humans and ecosystems in Southeast Asia and nectar feeding bats benefiting uh, ecosystems and humans in, in the American continent. But there's a lot more to say along those lines. That, that, that's a very good example. So yeah, just for the Chinese audience, just for, for you, Rodrigo, to know, there's a boom right now on durian demand in China. So then the Chinese consumers are kind of uh, learning about, about durian and they like it a lot. So that's going to bring big changes in the durian production with some negative impacts on on site because uh, they will be kind of clear of land and, and, and to produce more durians. But I think it's very important to highlight this, that the durian is, is bad pollinated. And, mm -hmm. and it is a very beautiful system. It's also elephant dispersed and, and bear dispersed. So then 
it's a, it's a very interesting plant in terms of plant animal interactions. Yeah. Then we have one question from uh, Baba Musa, is one of our postdocs here in XTBG. Great and fascinating presentation. Thank you, Professor Rodrigo Medellin. Talking about getting out of your comfort zones to explore different perspectives of conservation strategies, how do we get out of our comfort zones? Any practical clues, especially for early career researchers who may not have the independence to make in certain critical research decisions? Excellent question, Baba. Very good question. Um, what I can tell you is each and every one of us is going to find the best way to get out of your comfort zone. But you have to, to, to start by taking baby steps, getting out of your comfort zone and starting to talk to the director of wildlife in your province or the landowner in the next plot where you are uh, working or uh, somebody who may benefit from your work, but you never thought that they may benefit from the work that you're doing. I have no idea what is the line of work that you're invested in, Baba, but I'm sure that if you start thinking, what is the relevance of your work and who is the actual beneficiary of the work, reach out to them and start talking to them little by little one step after another. I mean, I, I remember when I started this, I went to the director of the wildlife service in Mexico and I told her that I wanted to work on uh, all of the other mammals, not bats in this tropical rainforest, the Lacandona. And she said, no, 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 because your work is absolutely useless for the local people, et cetera, et cetera. So here I am with all the patient in the world trying to explain to this person the benefits of knowing how the Lacandon Indians use of land system was useful for conservation and that we needed to learn from, uh, from them to benefit, to improve our management plan. But this is just one example, Baba. You are going to find your own ways of uh, getting out of your comfort zone, make it slow at the beginning, but as you, you will see, I put my hand in the fire for this. Once you're out of your comfort zone, you're going to enjoy it so much that you're going to get out again and again and again and again. And I, at my 66 years of age right now, continue to make my comfort zone grow and expand into different realms, different sectors. Thank you, Rodrigo. And then we have a question from uh, Prativa Katri, which is also one of our students. Uh, thank you, Rodrigo, for a very interesting presentation. I have two questions relative to the big horn ship. One, what was the reason for the reintroduction or maybe introduction? I don't know if there was any previous presence there of big horn ship in the island, in Tiburon Island. I like the name of the island. Yeah. And currently there is a huge decrease in the habitat of big horn ship. Are there any efforts going on for the reintroduction of them in the previous habitats? Very interesting question. And that gives me the opportunity to explain that supposed introduction. When that happened in, in 1975, and even when I started working in the island in 1995, we all assumed that the bighorn was actually an exotic invasive species in the island. There is a supposedly endemic subspecies of deer in the island. It's supposedly endemic because when we started doing the helicopter surveys, we saw them swimming those 500 meters from the continent to the island. So they're not endemic at all. But then what happened was that um, in 2005, some researchers from the University of Arizona went to the island to dig into this incredibly fascinating natural history concept, which is we have these rats, a rat this big, we call them pack rats. These pack rats build nests, nests that can be a meter and a half high. And every generation of pack rats adds to that nest finding crazy things that they seem to like. It may be a branch, it may be an old fruit, 
In recent years, it may be a piece of plastic or it may be a piece of metal, and they bring it there. And researchers in North America have learned that if you dig into those nests, you start finding clues of how the ecosystem has changed over thousands of years because all of these nests have been active for thousands of years. Well, we were lucky enough that in 2004, these researchers in Tiburon Island, digging into this nest, started finding bones of beacon sheep that were about a thousand years old. So it's only a thousand years old that the beacon disappeared from the island and they were actually reintroduced, not introduced. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, because I guess if there were, if there was no sign of native presence, you would have to think about whether you want to. Exactly. Well, I, I'm, you know, I, yeah. So then I, I'm, a, I'm very much into functional ecology and thinking about processes, and sometimes it might not be the same species, but it depends on what what you want to to achieve in terms of of the ecosystem management okay so then uh, do we have any other question from yeah, well the other question from, from uh, oh, sorry, yeah, was, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. there was a huge decrease in the habitat of bighorn sheep uh not in mexico in mexico the habitat is pretty stable and not only that we have in the mountains directly north from where i am right here we have a big influx of an exotic invasive from africa called the barbary sheep and they brought the Barbary sheep to Texas to hunt them because you know that in Texas they have more exotics than anywhere else in the world. They have giraffes, they have rhinos, they have elands, they have wildebeest, they have buffalo. You can go hunt buffalo in Texas. I don't know. Ask them. But, uh, but uh, some of those Barbary sheep escaped from the United States and started colonizing the mountains of the north of Mexico. Um, what that did was that uh, the Barbary sheep are extremely resistant to virtually any disease, any wildlife disease. And the bighorn are very sensitive to any wildlife disease, so much so that one contact nose to nose between a Barbary sheep and a bighorn sheep destroys the entire population of bighorn sheep. So when we started reintroducing them in those two places where I showed you in the map, I told them, okay, guys, what we need to do is to make absolutely certain that there is zero bighorn sheep there. And then they started removing the bighorn sheep because one hunt of, big, of oh, sorry, the barbary sheep, um, one hunt of barbary sheep sells for about $5,000. Whereas one direct hunt of bighorn sheep sells between 20 and $60,000. So there's no point for them to have barbary sheep. So they've been killing Barbary sheep all over the mountains of northern Mexico and removing them. And that is why the, the ecosystem in, in Mexico for beacon sheep is in very good shape. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. Is, sorry, a bit of topic. The Jaguar has been expanding into, into the United States. I saw some news that there were uh, Jaguars coming to Texas and some other states. Is that, is that correct? No, no, what happens is that they have uh, captive jaguars and, you know, there were jaguars there. Mm -hmm. As recently as uh, the 1800s, there were jaguars in Louisiana, in Texas, in New Mexico, and in Arizona. Today, I told you a lie because I told you that Mexico is the only country in the world who has an estimate of how many jaguars do we have. Because the other country that knows how many jaguars are there is the United States. They have one jaguar, exactly well, one. one jaguar. <laughs> and over the past 25 years, they have had one very old male that has dispersed from the, from the populations in northern Mexico across mm. the border and, and establishing themselves in Arizona and New Mexico, which is not habitat for jaguars. But they are really excited and crazy, happy that they have one very old male. But they have not had a female for the past at least 50 years. There's really no chance that they're going to have a, a sustainable population of, of jaguars in the United States. Above and beyond that, please remember that Donald Trump built 
this wall yeah. and have a student, Ganesh Marin, who has been working on documenting how that wall has been affecting the movements of bighorn mm -hmm. sheep, bronchorn antelope, pumas, deer, even jaguars. So I don't think they're going to have jaguars in the future. There is a push from one organization to come and, and get jaguars from Mexico and put them there. And I'm sorry, but that is over my dead body that I'm not going to let happen. They, they don't have the right habitat there. So it was in, in the war between Mexico and the US, I don't know how advanced it is in terms of the, the construction, but does it have a wildlife crossing infrastructure? I mean, is wildlife crossing a consideration? Is not? No. Uh, two years ago, one federal judge ruled that the wall had to have infrastructure for wildlife passes across the, the, the wall, hmm. and they have not done it. They have not done it. So at this point in time, it's impossible for those Jaguars to go over to the United States. I told them, you know, I said, we had a meeting to discuss whether we were going to give them Jaguars or not. I said, no, no, my friends. What we need to do is we need to join forces. You need to start investing in the conservation of the Northern Mexico populations and then open that damn wall and let the Jaguars disperse freely naturally and then you're gonna have your jaguars back but we're not gonna give you jaguars for a, a habitat that is far removed from the ideal optimal jaguar habitat mm -hmm. yeah. thank you very much Rodrigo. it has been a very very interesting uh, seminar i don't know if we have one more question but i think we are uh, we will have one final question let me just are you okay yes just, just a quick one so another from uh, one of our students from Naufal Avicenna says, as a scientist, we are very prone to mistakes and bad judgments. I guess as humans in general, yeah. sometimes we are not confident if our research will be useful or not. How do you build up the confidence to start something out and believe that your research will be useful, especially in the context of early career scientists? Oh my God, what an amazing question. I love the question. <laughs> I think let they saw you confident. You, and, and <laughs> let me tell you now, Faye, that we all make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. All I can do is to test the hypothesis again and again and again. And, I, and if I make mistakes, I am going to learn the, from those mistakes. In fact, I keep telling this to my students. We learn a lot more. We as scientists learn a lot more from our, mista from our mistakes rather than from our successes. A mistake it's a very educational process that is going to help you see things that you have not seen before. So don't be afraid of making mistakes. Make the mistakes, learn from them, and then correct the, the, the direction of the whatever uh, decision that you're making. But yeah, we all make mistakes all the time. Thank you, Rodrigo. So I think we will keep it here for, for this, this webinar. Thank you very much. It's been really interesting, I think. It's, it's very difficult to find people with that history of working in very different systems, a big scale with with clear impacts, not only for biodiversity, I think also for society. You know, I was, I was very, very impressed with the, the impact on the Surrey community and, and of course with the agave and the tequila industry. And, and I think it has been very, very kind of a inspirational for, for our students and our, and our audience. So just to the audience, remind that uh, next month we'll have the first Tuesday of uh, August. We have another another webinar. The speaker will be announced in the next uh, few days. And you know this happens every every month. Normally the first Tuesday of every of every month. Normally 4:30 p.m. Beijing time, depending on the time zone of our speaker. Thank you.